I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles now to Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6. Well, we have the privilege of having a Seder dinner coming, uh, coming up here on March 29th. Really looking forward to that. Well, it, it, not that we timed this out or planned this out, but we are uh, traveling through the book of Exodus right now. And uh, next week, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll look at chapter 6 and half of chapter 7 tonight. Uh, we'll finish chapter 7 and look at chapter 8 next week, the first four plagues. And then the following week after that, we'll look at the final six plagues. Uh, then I'll be gone in Turkey for a week. Pastor Dale will be teaching. And then when, then when we get back, we'll be looking at that final judgment, the death of the firstborn and the Passover. That will be uh, on March 24th. And then the very following week, we'll have our Seder dinner followed by Resurrection Sunday, and then we'll look at the Exodus and the parting of the Red Sea, which uh, depicts the resurrection, uh, the, the Wednesday after Resurrection Sunday. So uh, we'll, we'll be studying the very passage of Scripture as we, study, as we celebrate uh, the, the Passover uh, this coming year. So excited as, of course, the gospel is found right here in Exodus. Uh, this is the story of our deliverance. Exodus foreshadows the death of Christ and his resurrection for our salvation. The bringing out of the children of Israel from bondage and slavery to Egypt is a picture of the Lord bringing us out of the bondage and slavery of our sin. Uh, of course, the death of the, of the, or the sacrificial lamb placed over the, the doorposts. And, and so we're really looking forward to this, to this passage of Scripture as we continue to study through it. But right now, we, tonight where we find ourselves, we find Israel really at the lowest point of her history up until this time. Israel has been in Egyptian slavery and bondage. It's been difficult for decades. And they immediately had a little hope when Moses and Aaron showed up on the scene and they heard that they had a deliverer and so they were immediately excited. But then in chapter 5, we know that when Moses and Aaron first appeared to Pharaoh, there was a great backlash. Rather than Pharaoh accepting the signs and releasing the children of Israel from bondage, rather he stepped up his game of persecution and he said, you're idle. And now he made them work just as hard as they were before, the same quota of bricks but now he made them go out and gather their own straw, which previously had been supplied for them. And so when Moses and Aaron then came out of a meeting with Pharaoh right at the end of chapter 5, uh, the, uh, or when the, the Jewish uh, taskmasters were, were, or Jew, Jewish overseers of the work were coming out of a meeting with Pharaoh, they ran into Moses and Aaron. And right there at the end of chapter 5, they, they complained against Moses and Aaron and said, you have made us abhorrent in the eyes of Pharaoh. And so now there's, there's this, this hope that had been deferred. And so here in our passage before us, now we consider this tonight in this chapter and a half that we'll study. We consider obedience and confidence in the face of despair. We consider the, the, the true despair and hopelessness that the nation of Israel collectively was under at this time. And we see how the Lord still called them to obey, and the Lord still called them to be confident in himself. And so the Lord calls us to confidence and obedience, even in the face of despair. Proverbs 13, 12 tells us by way of introduction, hope deferred makes the heart sick. When there's something we're hoping for, especially after a long season of trouble, and that hope then is put off for another season, oh, how it can make the heart sick, really send us into a time of despair. However, when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. And when the Lord shows up and he does what only uh, he can do, oh, we will rejoice. And, and church, we're going to rejoice one day so greatly when we see the face of the Lord. And truly, as we look back on this historical account, we know what happens. We know the ten plagues. We know the mighty hand of the Lord. We know the great deliverance. We know the parting of the Red Sea. 
But the children of Israel did not yet have that historical account. Here they are down in the depth. They're in the valley. They're in a time of despair. They're wondering if deliverance will ever come. It's where we pick up our story in chapter 6, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of the land. Verse 1 sets forth the promise, a bold declaration from the Lord. A brother and I were talking recently about when the Lord begins to peacock, when he begins to declare who he is and what he's going to do. He does it all throughout Scripture. And this is one of those places. Here in the depth of despair, the valley of depression and discouragement, the Lord just simply says, now you will see. Do you see that phrase there right at the start of verse 1? Now, the Lord said, now you shall see. I like that. The now wasn't exactly right now. We don't know how many months all the plagues took, but it was a long, drawn-out process with many battles. You know what the Lord didn't say to Moses at the beginning? I'm going to send ten plagues. No, he didn't tell him how many plagues. There was one plague, and then two, and then Moses is thinking, maybe three. What's it going to be? Four, oh, five, we'll get him. Six, seven. Like, it was not until ten plagues later, and after every time, Pharaoh's heart was incredibly hard. But the Lord says, now you will see, and I like this, because every one of us could say this, now you shall see what the Lord will do, for with a strong hand, he will let them go, or, or at the Lord's strong hand, or through the plagues, Pharaoh will let them go, although he would dig in his heels for quite a while. And, uh, and, then, and then notice, and with a strong hand, he will uh, drive them out of the land. I mean, literally, the, the text is saying, Pharaoh will beg you to leave. And eventually, when the children of Israel would leave, that's what happened. So then to back that up, in verses 2 through 8, the Lord gives three I am statements five or four I have statements, and seven I will statements. And the three I am statements are all the same. I am the Lord. He says that three times in these verses. And then he gives the four I haves and the seven I wills. Let's look here. Uh, verse two. And so then God spoke to Moses, and this is where the Lord begins to peacock a little bit, like, okay, I got this. And the Lord spoke to Moses and said to him, I am am the Lord. Now this brings us back to the burning bush moment where the Lord revealed himself as the great I am. It's where the Lord would give the covenant name, Yahweh. Uh, we would call it the tetragrammaton in, in, the, in the English YHWH or yod hav vav hav in the Hebrew. Uh, sometimes it's translated Jehovah. But, or Yahweh. The Jews considered this name so holy they wouldn't even say it. Or they would just breathe it. Um, and, and they didn't have the vowels inserted. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob never knew God by this name. And that's what the Lord says here in verse 2. I am the Lord. He's, he's, this is similar to what the Lord had said to Moses at the burning bush. And he said, I, then he says this, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. That would be El Shaddai in the Hebrew. So Abraham always called God El Shaddai, or Elohim. Here now God is revealing himself as Yahweh, would become the Jewish name for God, the, the covenant name. And the, but the Lord is just simply saying, I am. And with that, we remember that God is the eternally existent, everlasting creator, all-powerful, covenant-keeping God of the universe. This is the I am that appears three times in this passage. And now here are the four I haves. Uh, I have appeared as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. So the Lord is first just saying, I, I first appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 4, and I have, the second time, I have established my covenant with them. And to them, the land, or to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. And then he also says, and I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And then here's the fourth I have. And I have 
remembered my covenant. So the Lord says, I have appeared to your forefathers. I have given them a covenant. I have heard the groaning. And I have remembered that covenant. So the Lord is simply saying with those words, I'm on top of it. I'm well aware. I am the God of the past. I started this covenant. And you know what? We need to remember for a minute to whom the covenant was first given. Abraham, when he was 75 years old and his wife was 65, she was about 10, 10 years younger than he was. And the covenant was a promise of great descendants and they were barren. And the fulfillment of that promise did not come until 25 years later when Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90. And so from the very beginning, this covenant-keeping God was accustomed to making promises that were somewhat unbelievable and for a while unfulfilled in the lives of his people. It's just who God is. And today there are promises that still loom large that the Lord will fulfill that still seem somewhat impossible or even unbelievable to us as people. But to be sure, as he said here, you shall see one day we will see the Lord reigning. The whole, the whole earth is going to know that Jesus is Lord. And they will bow their knee to him. Every knee one day will bow. And tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's kind of almost hard to believe that right now in our present culture, isn't it? But this is going to happen, to be sure. The Lord has declared it. Now, those are the four I haves. So the Lord says, hey, I've made this covenant. I've seen the bondage. I've, I've heard, you know, I've remembered. You know, I've heard the cry. I know what they're going through. Now, then, and so on the, the end, tail end of that, he now gives seven I will statements uh, where we... Pick up there in uh, verse 6. Therefore, say to the children of Israel, this is now before the seven I wills, he gives his second I am Lord. And, he just, he, and then he bookends it on the other end. Uh, so the seven I wills get bookended by uh, the I am Lord statement. So then in verse 6, so therefore say to the children, remember, I am Lord. Uh, again, it's cap whenever you see it, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in your English Bibles, then you can know in the Hebrew that that is the, the, the Hebrew word Yahweh um, or the covenant name of God. And so he says, I am the Lord. And then here are the seven I will statements. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Those are the first three. So I will bring you out, I will rescue you, and I will redeem you. They collectively all go together. Lord's, the Lord's saying, I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to redeem you. Then he says in verse 7, I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So the next two, or, or numbers 4 and 5, are, are also go together where the Lord says, I will be your God, you, and I will. So it's still, he's the one doing it. I will take you as my people. Not you will, but I will. I will take you as my people. And then in verse eight, the last two I wills, and he says, and I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. And then his last I am, I am the Lord. So the Lord truly peacocks there. Let's consider those seven I wills. And I, I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to re rescue you. I'm going to redeem you. I will be your God. I will take you as my people. I will bring you into the land and I will give it to you. And then I am the Lord. So we hear this in verses two through eight. Do we not? The Lord with strong, emphatic wording declares long and loud to his people, I am a covenant-keeping God. I know exactly where you're at, what you're going through, and I will remedy this situation. I will be faithful. The Lord is speaking this to Moses. At the depths of the despair of the children of Israel, Let's look at their response now in verse 9. 
So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel. Just Let's just pause right there, okay? Let's just pause here for a second. Read that first part of verse 9 over. I like it. Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel. Kind of sounds cool even. The Lord says this to Moses. Moses then goes and says, hey guys, God is the Lord. He, he has seen our, he's made a covenant with us. He's seen our burden. He's heard our cry. He's remembered his covenant. And he gave me seven I will statements. He's gonna, and he's going to rescue us. And we're going to be his people. And we're going to come into the land. And all of these great promises, like Moses just unloads this massive, awesome, God-centered sermon chock full of God's promises on the people. And what was their response? Now, middle of verse 9. But they did not heed Moses. Because, why? Why would they not heed such an awesome message? Because Moses was ineloquent when he, no. No. They did not heed Moses because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. The reason they could not embrace, believe, delight in these wonderful truths, the scripture tells us it was because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. That word anguish means despair or severe discouragement. Like they were in such a deep, dark place physically that the promises of God seemed to make to mean nothing to them. Then it says not only were they, not only was there anguish, but there was also cruel bondage. And that word cruel, well, is a cruel one. It means fierce bondage. Could also be translated severe or even violent bondage. They were just in such a terrible time in their history that the promises of God seemed to mean nothing to them. And you know, in Romans 8.18, it tells us there, the Apostle Paul says this, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We, we love that verse, right? It's saying, Paul's saying, you know what? These are the trials we're facing now. There'll be a day we're going to be in glory. And if we were to then compare the trials now with the glory we'll have then, it was like, it's not even a comparison. Like, the glory then is going to be so much greater than the trials now. Like, don't even weigh them against each other. But, leave, let's leave that verse up there for a second. There are many believers in, in the Bible and throughout church history and even to, today that flip that verse around. In the face of great despair and a friend comes with the great promises of God, they would say, I don't consider the glory or the promises of God even worthy to be compared to the, to the suffering that I am facing. And the greater of the two, by far, by far, in their present state and mind and depth of despair is the suffering that they face. Let's consider, or Elijah ran away after that victory and Jezebel's accusation, or Martha doubting and, and accusing the Lord at Lazarus' grave, and, or uh, Thomas doubting when he missed the appearance of the resurrection. And remember what Thomas had to say. He said, I need the touch. I need to place my, my finger there. And then the Lord did appear to Thomas in John 20, 29. And he said, come here, Thomas. You know, put your finger here. And because you've seen, you have believed. But blessed are those who will believe in me, having never seen me. And the children of Israel, Israel were right up against it. They were in the depth of despair, and they heard the enormous promises of God spoken over them. But their, their, their great suffering was a hindrance to faith. 
because all they could really associate with, all that was really tangible in their life was their suffering. And, and believer, I can say it, I, I cannot say it any more clearly. In times of despair and suffering and hopelessness, the Lord is near and his promises are as true in those hours as they ever will be in any time of heightened awareness of his goodness and sensitivity to it. The Lord is faithful, all his promises are true, and he will be glorified in your life. He will be your help, and he will accomplish what, what he pleases, and he will perfect that which concerns you. And you need not doubt his goodness, even especially in the face of great suffering. And so the Lord is good in, in incredible ways. And so verses 1 through 9, as we've seen, the Lord said, you will see this. And so because of that, Moses, you shall speak this. Like you need to keep going. And, and in the middle of Moses' suffering, not only was he to have confidence in the promises of God, 1 through 9, but he was supposed to walk in obedience. And the Lord will call you to do the same. So in a time of despair, it's easy to give in to sin, to give not in only to unbelief and complaint and maybe despair of heart, but it's sometimes it's very easy to give in to sin and to self-serving practices in times of suffering. And the Lord called Moses in that place to go on into obedience. So verse 10, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, go in, tell Pharaoh and king of Egypt, to let the children of Israel go out of his land. And then Moses was like, I don't see how this is going to work. Uh, Moses spoke to the Lord saying, The children of Israel have not heeded me. How much shall Pharaoh and Aaron and gave them a command for the children of Israel and for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt? The Lord's just stubborn on this. The Lord says, Okay, Moses. Go, tell Pharaoh. And Moses says there in verse 12, like, uh, I don't see how it's going to work. If Israel didn't hate me, how much is Pharaoh going to hate me? And he gives his excuse. He's like, I'm uncircumcised of lips. And he's just meaning, I don't speak well. He's not eloquent, as we saw earlier. But the Lord just stubbornly says, go, verse 13. Like, I told you to go, go. Like, we're not going to have a conversation about this. This is your next call. Be obedient. Do you remember when Elijah went running away and he quit his ministry? That was after that, after he challenged the prophets of Baal to that great duel and fire came down from heaven. And then he just did, it was like kind of an unmet expectation for him. He just thought, well, if I obey you, Lord, in this and do this, fire comes down from heaven. Everybody's going to see it and repent. They didn't repent. And Elijah still wants to take his head off. And so then he just went running all the way down. He tried to quit. And then that's when the, there was the thunder, thunder through the mountain and all that, and the wind ripping through the trees. But then the Lord spoke in the still, small voice. Remember what the Lord said to, to Elijah in that still, small voice? It was essentially this, go back to work. <laughs> this is what I asked you to do. Go do it. He's like, I'm still faithful. I'm still on my throne. You get back to work. And the Lord calls us just to obedience, even in the midst of suffering. And I like this about, but I really can relate with Moses in verse 12 because he thought somehow that the children of Israel didn't heed him because he was of uncircumcised lips. Like when the Lord thundered or spoke to him from the burning bush, Moses was probably greatly impacted. Then he tried to relay that same message to the children of Israel and they didn't listen. He's like, well, I, there's something. I, I don't speak well. It, it's got to be me. And we have to be, rem be reminded of these two things. Um, first off, future obedience shouldn't depend on past results. That means if I just served the Lord obediently and it didn't work, that doesn't excuse me from taking the next step in obedience. Moses didn't want to go on any further because he couldn't even get the children of Israel to heed him. So maybe you've labored and been obedient to do something and you don't see any fruit from it. You're like, well, I'm not going to do anything else. There wasn't anything fruit from, fruit from what I did before for you, Lord. No, future obedience doesn't depend on your past results. And then secondly, we have to get this through your your head, and I have to get it through mine, that lack of success does not necessarily rela relate to lack of skill. If you're like, oh, I've been preaching for 20 years, and like the church has grown by like three people. I must be a terrible preacher. Not necessarily so. 
maybe, but not necessarily so. Like, it's not just your lack of skill. Like, you got to get somebody else for the job. Moses was the man that the Lord wanted. Moses could have been the most eloquent person on planet Earth. Pharaoh still wasn't going to listen to him. And so we often, once we fail or falter, something goes wrong, we want to blame ourselves. Then we look too deep inside and we can find all sorts of flaws and inadequacies and weaknesses. And then we just want to give up. And the Lord wasn't going to allow Moses to give up. And he says, you just go. And then for some reason, the Holy Spirit decided at this point to insert a lengthy genealogy into the text and I think it's just to remind Moses and Aaron of their pedigree which wasn't much <laughs> and uh, and then the, the, the last two verses of chapter 6 almost shadow verses 10 through 13 that we just looked at so before we pick up our thought right there let's just consider this genealogy quick uh, and there, although there's lots of names the thread is really only about four of them uh, there's four important ones, I should say, uh, in this list. Verse 14, uh, these are the heads of their father's houses. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, were Hanak, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. These are the families of Reuben. So, so remember, uh, Levi was the thirdborn. So we're, we're initially just getting a list of all of Jacob's kids, Reuben, the firstborn. And then the second born, and the sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jake, and Zohar, and Sh Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. These were the families of Simeon. Those guys really are not significant to the purpose here, other than to bring us to the third born son of Jacob. And none of the other sons of Jacob are now mentioned here. The third born son is now Levi, and this is where Jacob's descendants end in this list. Uh, these are the names of the sons of Levi. So this is the first important name mentioned in that list, Levi. According to their generations, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, and the years of the life were, uh, of Levi were 137 years. And so the important ones are, are named with a number. So uh, Levi lived 137 years. And then we get his sons. So he, had, you know, his sons were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Then in verse 17, the sons of Gershon were Libni and Shimni, according to their families. And the sons of Kohath were Amram, Ishar, Hebron, and Uziel. So these are, so these are the sons of Levi. We've had two of them mentioned. The second one being Kohath, and he's the next important one on our list. And, uh, and then it tells us, in the years of the life of Kohath were 133 years. So it went from... Uh, Levi uh, now through Kohath through which uh, Abraham or through which uh, of course uh, Aaron and Moses would come and the years of the life of uh, Kohath were uh, 133 years then in verse 19 the sons of Merari were Mali and Mushi and I just like saying that uh, and then these are the families of Levi according to their generations uh, now Amram took for himself Jochebed, his father's sister, as wife, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. And now the third important name on the list. So it went Levi uh, to uh, Kohath, the sons of Kohath, and uh, now to Aaron and Moses. And uh, in the years of the life of Amram were 137. And so he, he's mentioned as the, the, the father of Aaron and Moses. Uh, then 21, the sons of Ishar were Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. Now Korah, not significant to the genealogy, but of course we would be the sons of Korah that were uh, essentially the, the, the brother to Amram, who was the parent to Aaron and Moses, uh, that would later become jealous of Aaron and Moses, his sons, uh, cousins of, uh, but still sons, descendants of Levi, uh, and they would have the, the rebellion of the sons of Korah incident you'll find later in, chap, in uh, the book of Numbers. Then verse 22, and then the sons of Uziel were Mishael, Elzaphan, and Zithri. Verse 23, Aaron took to himself Elisheba, daughter of Aminadab, sister of Nashon, as wife, and she bore him Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. And so the next important name here is Eleazar. So these are the sons of Aaron. Uh, he had four sons. We would remember that Nadab and Abihu, they, they would die in the fire when they offered profane fire. A fire would come down from heaven. Eleazar would be the priest that would take over after Aaron would die. The, this, the priestly descendants would go through Eleazar. 
And then verse 24, and the sons of Korah, so the distant cousins who would be angry, were Aser, Elkanah, and Abiasaph. Uh, these were the families of the Korahites. Uh, and then Eleazar, Aaron's son, took himself one of the daughters of Putiel as wife, and she bore Phineas. And the, I, the reason Phineas is mentioned here is just because we, we love Phineas in Numbers chapter 25 when the children of Israel were committing adultery with the Moabite women. And we remember Phineas came in and he took the javelin and he th thrust it through uh, to both, uh, through both the man and the woman uh, through their bodies as they were committing adultery and, and the plague was stopped. So Phineas would be somewhat of a hero of the faith later. And so he's mentioned. Uh, these are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites according to their families. Verse 26, and I don't know what my word per minute rate is right now, but I think it's up there. And then verse 26, so these are the names of the son of the, these are the same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies. These are the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, uh, to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. These are the same Moses and Aaron. So we just simply find uh, their descendants mentioned here, and we're just reminded that they are sons of Levi. I mean, uh, they, they who was the third son of Jacob, and we're just reminded of this great lineage. The Lord, of course, puts lineage in Scripture, so we can we can uh, we can place them historically. We also find the uh, the seed of Christ through there. But Moses and Aaron, specifically tied back to Levi, its importance as the priestly tribe. And nonetheless, the Lord, we just reminded, has called these people up out of nowhere, just out of promise, and, and it's based upon his promise. So then, verses 28 through 30, and it came to pass on the day the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I am the Lord, speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How shall Pharaoh heed me? I like this again. Like I said, it kind of foreshadows the time before. But the Lord again just says, Moses, be obedient. And, and look at the wording there where it says, On the day the Lord spoke, verse 28, that the Lord spoke, verse 29, it's, it, and he said, I am the Lord. Again, it's the, the covenant name. And then he said, speak to Pharaoh. And Moses said, how can I speak? So these verses simply say, on the day that the Lord spoke, the Lord spoke, saying, speak. And Moses says, I don't see how this is even going to work. <laughs> and so the Lord's, I mean, it can't be much clearer. God's like, just go. Open your mouth. I'll be with your mouth. In many ways, guys, it's just going to come down to that for us. You might not be called to be a full-time orator for the Lord today. You might not earn your weekly paycheck by teaching Bible studies. But it, in many ways, for the church, it's going to come down to us opening our mouth in these last days and speaking and declaring the name of Christ body-wide, church-wide, when we're asked a reason for the hope that lies within us. And we will speak, and we will boast, and we will proclaim Christ, and his name will be proclaimed to the ends of the earth. And so we'll look at the first 13 verses of chapter 7 now as we draw, draw uh, near to a close tonight. And here we just simply say, we, we see... In the first nine verses of chapter 6, this little recap, the Lord said, you will see, and he, and he boasts. The children of Israel come believe it. And then he said to Moses, you shall speak. Like, go speak. And then here he says, and the whole world will know. And here the Lord just declares that the whole world is going to see him, the whole known world at the time, and it's going to happen for us too. So then the Lord said to Moses, chapter 7, verse 1, see, I have made you as God of Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, shall be a prophet. You shall speak all that I command you. So again, there's the command to speak. And Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of the land. Remember, here's the Lord speaking to Moses, and because Moses couldn't do it, he's speaking to Aaron, and Aaron's going to say it. 
But nonetheless, the Lord's going get it, to get it done. Verse 3, but then the Lord says this, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not heed you, so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring them out and bring out the children of Israel from among them. So if you're following along in those verses, the Lord simply says this, I'm going to send you Pharaoh's heart. I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. He's not going to heed you so that I can bring down my fist in a mightier, stronger fashion. And then he's going to know that I am the Lord. And this is what's happening in our, in our day and age. There is such a blindness, a deception taking place, a madness against the Lord. And, you know, it can get worse before it gets better. And, and we, can, we, can, and we can trust in our Lord even when it seems like when you're speaking to somebody, their heart is hard, their eyes are as blind as they can be. But just as the Lord, through these great judgments, revealed himself to Pharaoh, so the Lord will reveal himself to the world. When the Lord Jesus returns, Revelation chapter 1 says, Every eye will see him, and the whole earth will mourn because of him. Even those who pierced him, the Lord's going to come and everyone will know. There's a prophecy in Habakkuk 2.14 that says this, And the glory of the Lord, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, just as the waters cover the sea. Just as the, the waters cover the depths of the seabeds, so this whole world is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. There's such a blindness and a madness right now about who Jesus is, about the truth of the gospel. The atheist and the agnostic way and the, uh, the, kind of the humanistic mindset is so prevalent around our world today. And there will be a day that every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And you know what? The longer the Lord allows us to go in a difficult fashion and the, the harder things, the sledding becomes, it seems like, the more glory he's going to get in the end. He's just going to come with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And so as we read through the book of Exodus throughout the rest of our time here, we're going to see exactly this. It's going to get worse before it gets better. It's going to be a long, drawn-out process. But in the, Lord, in the end, the Lord's going to be so triumphantly victorious and so then in verse 6, it says, Then Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord had commanded them, so they did. And uh, meaning they would go into Pharaoh. And do remember, not only was Moses ineloquent, but he was old. And Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. And then here's their first meeting, and this is where we'll end here tonight. Uh, then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show me a miracle, or show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, take your rod. Remember, this was the rod that the Lord gave Moses, but now Moses gave it to Aaron. And so Aaron's actually the one throwing down the rod. Uh, take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. So the Lord's already showed Moses this trick in the, in the desert. And so this was supposed to be their big sign, right? <laughs> they come into Pharaoh. Could you imagine how disheartening this would have been? Like, okay, here's the... Here, and then here's Moses. Like, he's like, oh, here, here, Aaron, you take it. You do it. Like, and then Aaron throws it down, and, and then it becomes a snake. And they're like, aha, Pharaoh... Yeah, let the people go. The, my staff became a snake. And, and like, you know, Pharaoh just yawns. You know, verse 10, So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so, just as the Lord commanded them. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his serpents, and, it became, or, and before his servants, and it became a serpent. And then Pharaoh says, well, well, he just calls his wise men and the sorcerers and the magicians of Egypt. And they also did in the same manner with their enchantments. And, uh, and Pharaoh's like, big deal, I, I can do that too. And they would have probably done that with satanic power. It wasn't some sort of sleight of hand. Uh, Satan does have power and signs and wonders. We know scripture through. And so through satanic power, they, would have, they were able to 
uh, through their little uh, black magic enchantments, uh, turn a rod into a snake as well. Uh, verse 12, and then so for every man threw down his rod and they became serpents, uh, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods and Pharaoh's heart grew hard and did not heed them as the Lord had said. So yes, God has power, Satan has power, God's power is greater than Satan's power, but Pharaoh's heart grew hard. And I just think about this last phrase and uh, we're about to come to the, the Lord's table and just share in communion as we end here. But can I, just, can I just, as we close, just draw your attention to that phrase, Pharaoh's heart grew hard. The Lord had power over Pharaoh's heart. And I remember a day talking to Stephen. I think he was in eighth grade. And I remember just looking at Stephen. And his heart was pretty hard. I remember the conversation. And I remember just trying to get through my teenage boy's thick skull some sort of truth. And I just remember him looking back at me, and I just remember his heart was hard. And, you know, as a dad, you just kind of want to sometimes reach in there and change your heart like somebody might put together a Rebics cube or something. Like reach right into the chest. We can't do that. Only the Lord can change a heart. The Lord would one day change Pharaoh's heart, and he would send the people out. But, you know, the Lord has changed many hard hearts through the years. He takes out a heart of stone and he gives a heart of flesh. And it's his goodness and his kindness that leads us to repentance. And I would even say, if you have a prodigal tonight, if you have somebody you love that has a hard heart, don't fret it, but trust the Lord with that hard heart. Only the Lord can change it. And you bring that heart to the Lord. And if that heart is yours, that frightens you, that's hard, again, bring it to the Lord. As only the Lord has power to change us from the inside out. The Lord knew right well what he was doing, and he right well knew the timetable of it all. The fact that Pharaoh said no the first, the second, the third, the fourth time did not dishearten our God whatsoever, because he never fails, he's never discouraged. And he knows what he's going to do. And so we would do well by being confident in him and in his goodness. That we would move forward in confidence and move forward in obedience, trusting our great God the whole process through. So let's bring the worship team up. The way we do, the way we share the Lord's uh, Supper on Wednesday night is, is just by allowing you to come and get your, the, your bread, the bread and cup yourself. Uh, the, on the table, the, the, the bread is in a cup underneath the, the juice cup. So you can just grab, grab one little set there and the bread and the cup are available. And it's just as we worship here, just feel free at any time as we close in worship to come and take the elements, go back to your chair. We won't pause and take the elements all together at any one point. Just go back and I just encourage you to have some time with the Lord and just pray and pour all your heart to Jesus tonight and let him wash over you and remind you of his goodness again and remind you of his promises and, and uh, let him soften your heart and just let him, let him come in and flood you afresh and anew with his grace. He died for you and he rose again to give you life and his promises are sure. Father, thank you that there'll be a day that we'll see you. Help us through obedience, through confidence, to move through seasons of despair, suffering, until we see you face to face. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for sending your only begotten Son Lord, as we close in, in the communion table at, at your feet, be near us, Lord, and, and bless this time how we love you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.